I am happy to welcome Mr. Silver Ceballos. Mr. Ceballos is a biotechnologist by profession from the Tecnológico de Costa Rica and graduate student in microbiology at the University of Costa Rica with almost 10 years of being involved in biological sciences, working on several research projects. He is currently working at the Center for Research in Cellular and Molecular Biology together with the host microorganism symbiosis research group led by Dr. Adrian Pinto Tomas. Aware that the fourth industrial revolution is biological, he has professional interests in microbial ecology, bio, bioprospecting, symbiosis, secondary metabolite biosynthesis, and synthetic biology. He is the co-founder of Rosalind Inventions, a STEM education company dedicated to creating tools and programs for school and college youth, teachers, and professionals in the natural and health sciences. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Ceballos. Thank you very much, Laura, for having me here. I have the opportunity to show a little bit about our work in bioinformatics teaching. So um, to start, I'm going to share my, my screen. Can you confirm, please, that you are seeing my presentation? Yes, we can see your presentation. Thank you very much. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the, um, the title for, for my speaking today is Breaking Barriers for Scientific Education in Latin America. Um, I'm going to introduce myself pretty quickly. Um, as Laura said, I'm a biotechnology engineer from Tecnológico Costa Rica. And right now I'm finishing my master's degree in the University of Costa Rica, specifically at the Faculty of Microbiology, in which I work in a research group dedicated to the study of symbiosis or interactions between insects and uh, bacteria, specifically bacteria that are, are um, capable to produce antibiotics. Right now I'm working with fungus growing ants and its symbiotic bacteria, um, which is called Pseudonocardia. I'm also um, a very creative person. Uh, I, I, um, I loved music, like doing it uh, for a long time. And I uh, something that characterizes myself is to uh, how art or, or, or this uh, creative can combine with science, and I'm going to show you how it looks like in here from Costa Rica. Um, uh, also, I'm a co-founder of Rosalind Innovations, uh, in which I develop as a lead developer. I'm in charge of designing uh, some uh, of the scientific programs that we have, and also about all the technical aspects that comes from the challenge of designing and executing those programs in here. Um, and to start, um, we are a STEM education company dedicated to promoting science in youth through experimental STEM programs, completely 100% experimental. Um, these programs are focused to um, high school students, for example, and also university students. Oh, we have a few experience with kids also. And before the pandemic starts, we were um, developing a lot of workshops in which uh, we engage uh, youth students with, for example, uh, activities such as uh, isolating microbes or doing experiments with microbes and also with fungi. But then the pandemic starts. And as, as, as you all know, we have like uh, a lot of trouble with presenciality. So basically um, our, our model uh, just got disrupted. We um, no longer have the availability of um, of young students or professionals also. So we have to transition for a more virtual uh, program that works for, for us and also for the persons. Um, and here we come to with idea to develop um, a scientific program that is dedicated to teach bioinformatics for public of Costa Rica primarily, but we are looking to expand it into other countries as uh, in Latin America as well. And I'm going to share with you some, some of the background uh, and also challenges that we have uh, in our country, which I hope that many of you also could familiarize with those um, 
with those challenges. First of all, uh, bioinformatics is not a new field. We all know that um, it's a field that has more than 20 years in developing, also aided by the emerging of new sequencing technologies and computational uh, capacity. But it feels very new to us. Um, we, for example, um, many bachelors in life science here uh, do not have bioinformatic courses in the programs. And if they have, they have just one course. Uh, also, there is a lack of well-trained professors in bioinformatics. And there are very few researchers that actually um, does um, res or employ bioinformatics in their research. Also, um, both teaching and learning bi bioinformatics could be very difficult, especially because of some of the backgrounds, uh, topics that are uh, employed to teach bioinformatics and, and concepts in cell biology or biochemistry and molecular biology could be um, very distant to uh, many early students, which do not have a proper background. So basically we, we have like this idea to, um, to design a, a program to engage um, beginners and early stage students and professional with bioinformatics um, in, in a way that um, it would be like a first step that could derive in more um, learning opportunities. Maybe for example, from platforms such as Coursera or maybe some international programs that are also available. But we want to focus in here with this uh, public, just beginners and early stage students. So we have like various challenges that we need to overcome in order to, um, to make like these persons, not only to like bioinformatics, but also to understand it and, and, con and want to continue to pursue like knowledge in this field. So, we designed a program that is basically conform of four things. Uh, first of all, is synchronic sessions in which um, we have like a masterclass. We view some concepts, review tools. Um, we also view case studies and some analysis that we, do, that we do with those tools. We also engage with activities and some worker, some homeworks in which we have extracurricular activities dedicated to strengthen some of the techniques or maybe some of the activities that we already see. We have lectures also to expand knowledge. We have evaluations and we have also um, a mentoring in which the participants are allowed to are allowed to make uh, questions. So we deliver a very quick um, answers to them to guide them through our program. And also, um, we use Google Classroom as uh, as a platform to unify all this. Uh, unify, for example, like the the classes, the videos, um, the extracurricular activities, the lectures, and it had uh, it had given us like very um, good results with the public that engage in our program. Also, uh, there are some things that we wanted to to make uh, to in, like to introduce in our program. Because of um, pers personal experience with these tools um, in the past, but also because of their potential. And uh, I want to introduce many uh, Benchling because it's like a cloud-based informatics platform for life science, and it's a very good one. I have been following Benchling since its start. I don't know, it's like eight years ago, maybe. Um, but it's great, all the, the capacities that it has right now and uh, the upgrades that have been also introduced. Um, it's great for managing, for example, biological data. Uh, you could have like folders in here and also uh, upload a lot of, of biological sequence and you can visualize very easily, create uh, multi multiple sequence alignments or, and it has other features. Um, that works very well as, as preliminary efforts. And also we have like some online bioinformatics tools such as the, the, the French portal of phylogeny um, in which we have like tools for trimming or doing multiple sequence alignments and also to create um, phylogenetic trees, which um, 
are very adequate for our purpose of teaching bioinformatics. And also we employ um, this third open uh, tool, which is ITIL or on the Tree of Life, International Tree of Life, for visualization of genetic trees. So basically, we are um, like combining uh, different tools to employ this program. It's Google Classroom for the resources, uh, but also benchling for the managing of all the data that is um, that is given to the students, and also um, a set of tools that are publicly and, and anyone can use them. They're open source and also these tools that is uh, well known and, and used uh, in the visualization of other genetic data. So I'm going to give you right now like a, a, a really quick overview with topics and the case studies uh, that we use to teach bioinformatics, which I hope that uh, could inspire many other initiatives this and also, uh, so it has worked really great for us. So first of all, like we have uh, this program in space of four sessions. Um, the, the session number one is pretty focused on databases and management of biological data. We use a case study, uh, which is the, the virus that is the cause of the pandemic. And also um, what we do pre um, pretty basically is to explore um, mutations on the spike protein. So NCBI has a, a really great portal to look on information about um, this SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we focus uh, specifically on, on spike sequences in which uh, we review a question such as what is bioinformatics, what a biological database, and what is the, the virus and how does it look like? So basically we obtain a lot of sequence from these virus that are publicly available and comes from different uh, parts of the world latin america united states europe africa uh, asia also australia and we can use those data to explore mutations and we can up, up, upload the data to benchling we can quickly very quickly observe its sequence a lot of residues and also identify um, mutations in here. So that is like, like our first approach to the use of benchling. Prevalence is one, uh, it's a, a basic but a very robust skill that we teach in this program on how to, to get all the advantage of a platform so, such as benchling. We then have like a second, a second session which is called genetics and evolution. We, um, in here, we start by doing some more advanced analysis. In here, we try to obtain sequence. We, we focus um, primarily on the, like the searching of sequence in databases, how you obtain those sequence, you upload them and you manage them in folders. But in here, we advance a step further in for example, in constructing um, multiple sequence alignments and how to visualize those alignments. And we use a case study based on foodborne pathogens. And why foodborne pathogens? Because it's really easy to, to maybe understand the issue here. I think, um, well, it's, it's a very important um, issue around the world, but also um, I think everybody has uh, one in life, like an experience with diarrhea, and also we explored like um, this thing that diarrhea is like a very critical disease uh, around the world and it's caused by bacteria. So we, we, we try to also to explore further uh, these uh, microbes that are cause uh, diarrhea, such as the coliforms, for example. So we use, uh, questions such as how to construct a database that we can explore later, how to, or what is like also multiple sequence alignment, how we do that, and what is the evolutionary origins of coliforms, those bacteria that are well known for causing um, disease and are well transmitted in, in food. So basically, um, we, we try to, to also to obtain a lot of sequences from coliforms, 
uh, from the GeneBank database, we also construct and create a, a database. And we engage in activities such as constructing multiple sequence lines in MAFT, which is a pretty famous tool, and also to start uh, looking at preliminary phylogeny. So in here, um, we also try to, to expand, you know, on the, on the relationships of Escrigia and Chihela, for example, which is our two species uh, that causes some debate because some microbiologists uh, believe that they are one species that just have like a speciation event. And other microbiologists uh, tend to argument that they are different species. And also to look at other um, types of bacteria that are pretty interesting, just as there's in apestis, which is uh, one a, a pandemic bacteria in the past. And we engage in here, like doing some starting phylogeny, um, you know, like starting to grasp concepts about how phylogeny works and how to also interpret uh, phylogenetic trees. And this case also has like a, a, a really cool activity in which um, the students try to obtain different sequences from other organisms and try to include those sequences into the database uh, and try to reconstruct again a multiple sequence alignment, try to reconstruct uh, another phylogenetic tree and then compare the new phylogenetic tree with the older one to see how does it uh, differ and what does it happen, what does, does happen in the analysis. And we have uh, two other two other sessions uh, dedicated exclusively to explore uh, phylogenetics a little bit more. And for this, we use a model organism that is called Costridoli difficilis for a various of reasons. Um, first of all, because um, it is a very important um, pathogen here in Costa Rica. And also it's internationally is well known as a model of organism because it uh, produces uh, various toxins, which um, play a big role in pathology. And also well, in, in countries such as United States, like it is a, a very big, big problem, not only because of the fatalities of the disease, but also because of the recurrence, which produces itself in an economic cost. So um, we explored questions such as how the toxins look like from a phylogenetic perspective, or are toxins from um, Clostridium, Clostridium that is difficile derived from Costa Rica are similar to other toxins from isolates around the world. Uh, and also in here, we have a, a pretty interesting future in which we, um, we basically we employ genomes from Costa Rican isolates that have been isolated from um, an outbreak that uh, happened in two, like 2010, around 2010. Uh, and a lot of, from those isolates, like a few of them um, um, got sequenced and the, the data is like publicly available. So this is, this is something that we want to, to like, a, like some kind of signature to employ um, sequences that are uh, derived from our country. Uh, not also because it is like important, it's public funding, uh, funded by the state, but also because uh, it, it is very important for us to engage in science outreach and, and to let people know about some efforts that are uh, done in, in some of our universities. So we employ um, genome data from these uh, Clostridioide difficile isolates to, um, to look for toxin sequences and then uh, managing those in, in benchling, for example, but also use, it, use them to construct um, phylogenies of the toxins. And we also include um, a database, like a basic database with uh, reference organisms such as outgroups in order to improve our phylogeny. So this could be like a, a very good figure of how the phylogeny of these toxins look like in which isolates of Costa Rica uh, tend to group in these clades and these ones here. 
and in an, in the, and also in the last uh, in the last session, uh, we try to create a typification of clostridioides difficultly using multi multiple sequence alignment, which is a very common uh, technique used in epidemiology. And so we basically um, teach the students to how to obtain housekeeping gene sequence from genomes and how to use them to construct uh, uh, multiple um, well, to construct the sequences that are employed later in the in this type of analysis. And we try to answer if these genomes, the phylogeny of these genomes using MLST looks similar to the toxin phylogeny, in which we already know that we have differences. The phylogeny, the genome phylogeny is very, uh, uh, it's very similar, the, the isolates, but the toxins of those isolates is very different. So it's, it's a very nice result to illustrate how, um, how some features of genomes such as toxins have a different evolutionary path as the, the genome or the general chromosome. It has different uh, evolutionary pressures, and and that is something that is really really interesting to to learn. So uh, some conclusion about our experience is that um, we have uh, approximately like one year to teach this program. More than fifty students um, have passed through. Let's make bioinformatics. Um, also, we try to offer this program to university students and professionals from different countries which are um, interested, for example, in pursuing um, master degrees. And also, um, as, a, as the professor or instructor of this program, we, ha we have uh, seen that the implementation of case studies and model organisms improve both teaching, but also learning. Like it's more, uh, it's, it's more concrete to illustrate some uh, how bioinformatic analysis can be employed in in, in different um, cases, scenarios in real life. And also, um, well, always the alumni share like a desire to continue learning bioinformatics. So it's like a good sign for us. So that's, um, so that's like the summary of, of, uh, of this program that we uh, share with you. And also that is continually offered to students here in Costa Rica. So thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Ceballos. That was a very informative talk. All right, we have a few questions for you. Um, number one, with so much antibi antimicrobial resistance happening because of the overuse of antibiotics, do you think bioinformatics can be useful to track and overcome this challenge? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, I think it's like a global phenomenon. Uh, we are starting to to obtain isolates that have uh, resistance. Also, we have, as a country, we have different efforts to survey for microbials that present uh, resistance. Also, uh, well, I personally might participate in uh, a big research project that is um, focus on discovering novel uh, antibiotics. Basically, we have a, a very big bioprospection operation that uh, isolate and obtain microbes from insects and then test them against uh, um, a panel of clinical pathogens in order to look for interesting isolates that are then uh, transferred to um, a university in the United States. So, so it is like a great um, necessity and all around the world to not only to survey for uh, resistant pathogens, but also to look for novel sources of antibiotics. And what was the second question? Excuse me. Yeah, so um, the second question is, what are some of the ways that students from South America can find mentors uh, that can expand their horizons and help them gain insights into specialized topics like bioinformatics? So some of these um, bioinformatics analyses are well known or applied to this, both this case of antimicrobial resistance, but also in epidemiology, uh, in research also. 
um, I believe universities are making an effort to include bioinformatics in their programs, but it's a long it's a long way to to get to that. So um, I believe, for example, if you well, one of the purpose of this course is just to to bring a starting point. Um, and I think that is very important if you want to to engage in bioinformatics, like to have a good starting point in which you like can um, have like a, a little grasp of the concepts that are or the concepts or the techniques or the tools that are taught in bioinformatics. So you could advance in other types of programs. And I think uh, uh, programs such as as the ones offered in Coursera are like a, a very good uh, second stage to um, explore like more different tools and also start in coding, which is like the final, um, I think it's the final objective. I, I myself um, do bioinformatic analysis uh, in, in clusters and, and use like the coding stuff. But if you are an early stage student, like it's going to, maybe you're going to get afraid of the coding and, and maybe that also um, it's turn you, turns you down. So that's like the barrier that we are trying to to break. That it, it's coding is is not uh, always. I know it's it's kind to be difficult, uh, and you have time and a lot of practice. But it's easier to start coding if you have like a, a good grasp of what's going on.